Hi, Ari. I'm very happy that uh, today we are having this conversation. Likewise. Uh, most of people like me who know you as a network scientist uh, know you because of your work on temporal networks. I mean, we have two of your uh, big reviews, like collections of papers and uh, other stuff on temporal networks. But I know that you started from physics and your trajectory is kind of interesting because you were in academia, you left academia, and then you got back and now you're in networks. How did it happen to you? It happened randomly. Well, not randomly, but it happened like, like uh, what words did I use? Like gradient descent or ascent towards an unknown goal. So, uh -huh. so basically making it up at each point of the path, making choices that led somewhere. So, so, so there was no overarching goal here. First, I was an experimental physicist doing ultra low, temp or low temperature physics, milli Kelvin te uh, temperature physics. That was basically something I enjoyed a lot, but that was a bit too slow for me because the cycle where you design and build an experiment, get results for some service to come and explain them to you is like a couple of years. So, so you so, literally did experimental type of physics. Yes, absolutely. Also. Absolutely. No computational, I, no coding. Of course, there's always a bit of coding. I mean, okay. You need to, you, you get data, you need uh -huh. to make sense of your results. You need to write code that controls the experimental apparatus. So I mm -hmm. did a lot of that. Wrote programs that measured things, okay. for example. But yeah, that was, that was really sort of building things with my hands mm -hmm. type of physics. Uh, then... That was the time of the sort of telecom boom. So I went to the telecom industry. I had, as my minor at Alta during my PhD, I had... Um, so wait, was it like immediately after your PhD or some years you were in academia? So no, immediately after my uh -huh. PhD, actually even before my PhD. So I mean, after I handed in my thesis, I almost uh -huh. immediately got hired by one of the telecom companies. Ah, I see. And, and at the same time, I had also, during my PhD, my minor was uh, something like machine learning. Uh -huh. So I, I, that was the early days of neural networks and feed forward things and coordinate maps and such things. So I, I had, through that, I had learned to deal with data. And I went to the telecom industry in, so, in a sort of way where I was interested in the data that they gathered about people. So I, uh -huh. I worked on churn management, churn meaning customers okay. leaving and trying to predict that and trying to sort of monitor it and com uh, it. compute it. And so, so this kind of data-driven stuff in the telecom industry, then at some point I jumped. So it was like 20 years ago or something? It was an eternity ago, yes. More than, more than yeah, that was in 19, I defended 1998. Okay. Then... We founded a company with some friends of mine, and basically, then we did data science and the sorts of things that everyone does nowadays. We were just 20 years too early, unfortunately, for telecom companies and for others. And and I worked in this company for, for a couple of years, and then I then realized that, okay, I mean, if um, experimental physics was too slow for me, mm -hmm. then this company thing is like, it's in a way too fast or, or you, can, you can't think deeply enough because that is not what is required. You need products out of, you need to have products that, that your customers will buy and it doesn't really matter if that product is perfect, it's better to have a product. And so, so then I kind of felt that, ah, oh, and I want to, I want to think about things. Okay. <laughs> and at that time, network science was already born. So was, this was like 2002 to 2003 yeah, or something. Very early and, stage. Yeah, yeah. And I, I kept reading academic papers. And, and this is something I discovered that, man, this is something like, I can, I can kind of relate to this. I, I, I like this stuff. So this, this has meaning and it, it kind of connected those streams that there's physics and there's data on people's behavior uh -huh. and and yeah so, and, and these networks have properties that you can understand through statistical physics uh -huh. which was what i was so it kind of yeah my interests came together there 
and then I returned to the academic world. And, so, and... so wait, uh, so for how many years you were in the industry? Like, oh, from because nineteen ninety eight, yeah, five years. Like yeah. Okay, and then how you came back? Like... How how did I come back? So I I looked up people who do some interesting things. Um, I stumbled across Kim Okaski, who yeah. has already had some PhD student working on that. Part. See. And then I simply sort of told him that, would you have funding for a bit? I would like to come and work on networks. And he was crazy enough to say yes, because this is not your normal thing that someone from the yeah, industry I mean, wants, wants without, without any... I mean, back then, even there was no notion of network science. Like, it was, like, so new. And... Yeah, 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 exactly. It, yeah. It and, was. and even Alto is not like Kimo was at that time here at Alto, right? Alto didn't exist with yeah, yeah, the I mean, University yeah, of yeah. Technology, but he was here, yes. Yeah, but like I mean, even here the physics department or whatever it was called that time is not like that huge, so that it no, includes no. all of these. No, and he, he was he was basically he would uh, he was running a department called or it wasn't the department, it was LCE, Laboratory of Computational Engineering was the uh -huh. place where and and many many other people some some of the neuroscientists were there some of the Bayesian people who are now in this so so it was kind of a yeah it was it a place where many the, things came together okay. many many people who did computational various sorts of computational Science. new things okay. were at that place at that time so I entered that As and a then that's uh, yeah as a postdoc or something <laughs> also these. These job descriptions were a bit different mm -hmm. around those times. So, I mean, now we have a very strict system. PhD, yeah, yeah, yeah. postdoc, assistant, professor, blah, 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 blah. But then it was, yeah, 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 you saw it, you are a I researcher. Did. So, okay. so I was researcher, senior researcher, something, and then I'm still on that path. So this has been the... Okay, and, and you've always been then at Alto, whatever it has been always called, since then. Since, since then, yes, yes. So I've made some visits to places, Oxford, uh, some, I've, I've spent a bit of time in okay, other places, cool. but not like, not like, I've not been employed mm. by anywhere else. So technically you have never had any formal training or you have never been grad school for network science. No, you were yes. the yes. people who built yes. network science. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah I, I, I learned it myself on my own because everyone else was doing yeah, that. Do you well. remember what were your early papers? Um, I mean, we can of course check your no, please, but, no, but, no, please, but like, please, uh, please, no. What different <laughs> topics you started working on? Very similar topics as nowadays. So the first first one was some some spreading process type of thing on small world network mm -hmm. ideas. Uh, nothing very nothing very major there. Uh, then random walks on networks mm -hmm. and how you can use random walk processes to generate scale free networks so that sort mm -hmm. of processes that happen on networks or that build networks. I see. That kind of and then we went then we went into this mobile telephone, big social network oh. stuff a bit later. And weighted networks was the next thing that, that popped up. So Yuka Pekka was with me. Mm -hmm. And then we worked a lot on different weighted network things and then the big mobile data that 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 mm -hmm. we got that the group got from last load through yeah. Kima. Yeah, and when did you start working on temporal networks? Was it after that? Yeah, after I mean, after those weighted network papers where you aggregate the calls in uh -huh. the rates, then of course the next yeah thought is that yeah, but what if what I use oh, exactly what if I use those times of the calls? Okay, so what happens then? Which was that was the level of sophistication that mm. we had at that point. And look. I mean, we have timestamps of gold. Now let's put some processes on top of that. What happens? Yeah. So we were not looking for burstiness, so we were not yeah. looking for any 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 deeper thing than that. We were just sort of toying around, and then we discovered what? that that processes look slow on on top of this mobile data. Oh yeah, I, I like that. Too. Why are they so bloody slow? And then we. Later, kind of discovered that yeah, this person this thing has now something to do with it. If you look mm -hmm. at the internet distribution, See, but it was really just sort of yeah, play, was... playful exploration is what how we started. Okay. Do you identify as a physicist, or you don't care about these type of titles or whatever people say? 
That is a very difficult question that, that I often ask myself. So I don't yeah, ask much about these things mm -hmm. as some people do. If I would want to name one science that I would be mm -hmm. sort of affiliated with, yeah, yeah that would be physics. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, certainly I, not computer science, it's not mathematics, it's not any of the other things that I do. It's not uh, I've done a lot of social science related things, but man, I'm not a social scientist. That that's simply I no, yeah, yeah. no, no. I don't know enough about it. That uh, physics is probably the only field where I could say that I know enough about it to sort of be able to call myself at least a bit of a physicist. Yeah. <laughs> Most of the other fields now. Once we had this uh, conversation with RS that uh, I am always curious to go and check the homepage of different network scientists and see what they are like because this is they, what they play. Yeah. And with Yari is like that you open his homepage and it said it's complex. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. yeah. But I'm a scientist. That's that, that, that's, that's something that's that a I good can, thing. Okay. I can basically say cool. with with full certainty. All yeah, the rest yeah. is a bit more. Idea. Yeah, yeah. But like you, you are the type of scientist I always wanted to be. So like. First of all, you're a very cool person. You are good in music. You're a bassist, right? So you play in a band. You're a good researcher. And uh, you were flexible enough to leave academia. And you were... Okay, what is a polite way of crazy enough to get back to academia? Someone... <laughs> well, you can ask him or ask him that because it, it's, it's more like someone is crazy enough to hire you back to academia. <laughs> so it's, yeah. But I mean... Uh, Kimo knew you, right? No, Before, no, he didn't. Okay. No, no, I came out of the blue and I told him that I want to do networks. And it was probably a big, big, big stretch of luck that he happened to have some like available fund. Very good to say, like a CV or something? Like... Well, I, I graduated from the Law Temp Lab, so it's so some it PRS on the CV oh, and okay. some stuff like that, but it's more like, well, I think it was more like that I was really interested. Okay. I was convinced this is what I want to do. And he happened to have some loose funding, so. Why not try? Okay, try. Sure. So, and then basically network science in Alto kind of got shaped because you start working on that and then Kimo himself and some people. Yuka Pekka Onela was, and Janos. Janos was, Janos Kertes was here from the very beginning because he had been collaborating with Kimo. Uh -huh. So, so, so Yuka Pekka, Janos, Kimo, me, I think this. this so Janos was not working um, on networks before you. Was, he was. Yeah. So because that, yeah, yeah, he was already yeah, getting yeah. started in that. So, so then okay. this was a kind of lucky coincidence that all yeah. of us I mean maybe Kimo had some idea about a good investment mm -hmm. as like Janish. okay but, cool yeah yeah but at that time there were many other things that we, were being done like um, someone did a bit of game theory someone did a bit of uh these econophysics stock market things and that's where networks probably came in before me you come back on and I did some stock market correlation stuff early very early network analysis of data sets so. yeah i was trying to think that what i remember from those years and i realized i was in elementary school so <laughs> it's kind of new but okay working on networks as like the own type of structure small world network business temporal network then you move to more like computational social science projects and these days, uh, you are kind of working on so many different stuff. Yes, right? I am. You are working on neuroscience, you are working on epidemic spreading, you are working on uh, more of data-oriented researches. And apparently these days you have like, uh, like these days, if someone check your website, it seems that you are working on so many stuff together, right? So now what, of course, like you are now a very seasoned researcher, you are like full professor here and it makes sense. But the question is, uh, how do you choose to work on something? Does it, which one comes first? Is it like a good question? Is it like a good team? You find new collaborators, you find like some extraordinary like people to work with in terms of collaborators or your like PhD student. Like what comes first for you? Like what is the most important item so that you say, okay, let's do a project on that? No, well, that 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 depends a lot. So it's it's um sometimes nowadays people find me. 
So, mm -hmm. for example, I started doing immunology because people who do immunology called me and asked that, that, that the methods that I have, would they be able to help in in answering certain types of questions? And I was like, mm, sounds interesting. I've always wanted to learn more about immunology, so let's go. <laughs> so, so I just followed my interest there and people people had heard about the methods of, of uh, complexity science. So, mm. So, so sometimes it's like this, and with some social scientists now it's also the same that 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 yeah people ask if the methods that that we know or the type of thinking that we have can help with their questions, and then the questions come from others. Sometimes it's more like I don't know we chat over coffee like we do here, then there's a so-called mothership connection, mother mothership connection that something just sort of beams to our heads that hey did you ever think of this. And then some good idea forms, and then we start working. So it's almost like, I don't know, you are <laughs> listening to a broadcast from somewhere. It just sort of pops up randomly okay. from nowhere. So sometimes it's like this. It it really depends. And sometimes it's like yeah, a mixture of, you know that, yeah, we have this big, big funding for this kind of a theme, and we should yeah. think of questions that are somehow related, and then things start happening. Discussions are good for Get mm -hmm. those ideas. So, like, uh, do you have uh, this type of a big picture or a big plan for your research? Yes, question? I've never had. I know that some people have that, and I know that some people want to have this big sort of, yeah. I don't know, overarching career plan. I, no, nah. Okay, I, I'm, I'm just winging it and following my interests. Of course, I mean, there is something that it's not random in the mm -hmm. way that, that, that. I would, I, what's the word that one should use here? Intuition, probably. Mm -hmm. Is that you see that, ah, so somewhere in there, there is something that, that, that mm -hmm. could be understood using the type of tools that we have. I see. And there's an interesting question, and there's, often it's a bit vague that you don't know exactly the way forward, but, mm -hmm. but you see that, ah, so that's an interesting area there's probably something there that that one could some important questions there that mm -hmm. you could tackle with the type of tools that yeah. that we have but i'm not i'm not a believer in mm -hmm. this holy grail questions that, yeah there's this big question everyone goes i see. i i view that science is a bit more like you know evolution of an ecosystem or something that you need diversity and different types of questions mm. and then you move forward instead of every organism trying to do exactly the same thing exactly that niche is so I, mean, I like this yeah, sort that, of, that's actually a very this randomness is something that i think is very beneficial for science and this is absolutely against how the academic system is built up it's against how the funding system is built so it's it's something that i don't know why why it's not typically appreciated I mean, yeah i mean i totally understand because like science by its very nature is like a very explorative type of approach but at the same time we have these old school sciences like physics mathematics that for example we have these big questions that you can just toast them and just pinpoint this and just okay we want to understand dark matter we want to find the largest prime number we want to do this yeah. and kind of these things can shape you know like this academic plan but network science and complex systems on the other hand it's new and there is no like a major question i would say I don't know how you see yeah, it. Yeah, okay, so I, I've seen the evolution of this whole thing. Uh -huh. And and there were more major questions at, at the sort of early stages. Yeah. Like, yeah, I mean, people people looked at networks. Well, they all look a bit like the same. So why is this? That's the question behind yeah. all these uh, scale free and then clustering. And we've used network proper properties. That, that was a question. Why do networks look this mm -hmm. way? And then later questions started sort of becoming subfields on their own, but like temporal networks. So, mm. ah, but if you think that your interactions are limited in time, then what, what, what happens? Mm. That's a big overarching question. And I think network science is probably now at the stage where some of these early methodological frameworks were sort of, that they are not complete. So it's not that we are mm. at the stage where 
where, where you, one could proclaim that, that everything has been done, but some of them have been done now. And then there are some sort of newer open questions with some frameworks that have been emerging. And this is, I think, the typical process, progress of evolution and science, that first there is this big sort of a bit hazy question and then sub questions appear and then maybe people are at some point sort of looking for new questions to appear and they will and they might be I don't know network science in combination with something entirely different and that leads to something new so yeah if you view this as a process of evolution where sometimes you make major leaps sometimes uh -huh. you make smaller leaps the main thing is that things keep moving forward right? sure where do you think network science will be in the next 20 years? I have no idea whatsoever. Because I have heard it from people that they would say physics and computer science would always be there forever. But network science may change to something else because of so many reasons. And these days, apparently, AI and all types of it are kind of winning and maybe these type of approaches get expired at some point. Oh, Do you think even it's worthy of talking about this type of question? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And this is, of course, I mean, as a, as a network scientist, this is what I spend a lot of my time thinking uh -huh. about. Where are things going and where should they go? But I think here, one could think that network science is, uh, would it be, if someone asks where is statistical physics going, mm -hmm. does that sound as an odd question to you? Or a question that people would ask, where is statistical physics going? And I think network science is a bit like that. You know, it's a body of knowledge, a body of methods, and a body of theory that was kind of born in a burst, right? That started oh. like 20 years ago. And now this body is here. It has not been entirely mapped out, but uh -huh. here it is. And then the next, what happens next is, what are you going to do with this body of things that, that we now have? Maybe, I don't know, maybe someone wants an application to machine learning that leads to somewhere new and different. Maybe someone really starts to figure out how the brain works mm. with some, I don't know, temporal network ideas of, of criticality and spike trains and whatnot, and that leads somewhere. or. And I think this is the network science is a, it, it's a bit like statistical physics, but it, it's a body of methods and a way of looking at things. I see. But rather than that, it's it's like a science like physics, which is a much broader thing of computer knowledge, which is a very broad and sort of you know, defined thing. Yeah, yeah. But the thing is, like, a statistical physics has its roots in physics and in like experiences, like in little hands-on experience that you do in a lab, but like uh, network science is much different. Like when you say partition function in physics, people know what it is. When you say entropy, they know what it is. Mm -hmm. These days, when we talk about networks, even as an ensemble, we're talking about entropy of networks or these things are not that much. I mean, sometimes they do not even make sense. So it's like, mm -hmm. so it's, if even the applied side of statistical physics, I believe still is much less applied at network science, because as you mentioned, like, these days, everyone who is thinking of network science is thinking of network science applied somewhere, like mm -hmm. neuroscience, mm -hmm. I don't know, epidemic spring. Mm -hmm. So apparently, it's like a very handy tool that we can use it and borrow yes. it. Yes. But we are not sure or we don't see how the main toolbox itself is evolving, you know? Right. Okay, of course, there are now these streams of evolution within the main toolbox that there are, there are people are working on side networks that, that and there are a lot of unknowns there or people are working on on higher order things and yeah. simply sub complexes or then people are working on on network inference, which was a sort of very un, underdeveloped area for a long time. So there are these streams going on in there, mm -hmm. but where, where this will to me, this is like, yeah, something was born, some things were mapped out, now people are busy mapping out the things that were not mapped out before, and at some point, something more transformative is coming along. So that, you know, this is, if we do this, then we can figure out the universe in more clever ways. This is what happens to all sciences normally, but okay. science is a process of evolution. Sometimes there are big leaps, sometimes small leaps, sometimes, yeah, okay. I don't know. Okay. It's like a fractal stream of questions I have questions within them that some questions, questions within them and when some of those have been answered then entirely new questions pop up 
Okay, let's let's get back to the more narrowed down question of doing research in network science. Uh, imagine someone comes to you and say, hey, Yari, we are working on this, that, something. Mm -hmm. We have an interesting uh, puzzle that you may be an expert to help us. Mm -hmm. Then what are the criteria that you find a question, like a good one in general? Like even if you are not, if, if you're not willing to work on that, but say, oh, that's a nice question. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. I, I don't have time for it. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> Usually I immediately say yes. That's a nice okay. question. Let's start working. But, but in reality, if, yeah. <laughs> if, if I was more strict about it, so what are the questions of a or the, the question the criteria is criteria for a good question? Yeah, yeah. Basically, this is what you're asking. And, and then, well, first let's start with this fractal idea again, because there are in science, there are big questions that have smaller questions inside them that have smaller questions inside of them. And um, so there is no universal definition of a good question in a way that mm -hmm. question can be pretty small and pretty innocent looking. And once you answer it, it can lead to something, something big. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let me, let me make so an the, example. That, yeah. Like in physics, there are always these type of problems that, for example, imagine the icing problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. 1D icing, trivial, no phase transition. Mm -hmm. Then someone comes with 2D icing, okay, tricky. But anyway, mm -hmm. there is this Onzager who fix it. Mm -hmm. And then it's 3D, we have no idea. Mm -hmm. And for 4D and higher dimension, depending on the lattice or whatever, we mm -hmm. have like mean fix. Yes. So like working on 1D to 2D or making the dimension larger and larger mm -hmm. was something. Yes. <laughs> so it was a good question. Yes, yes. exactly. Exactly. But there are other questions that some people solve it in dimension D and someone else just solve it in dimension D plus one. one so, yeah, yeah. And why? Because, uh, well, there was this PhD student who needed a project and some of these people are really good. Like I always see physicists of my age that are much better than me in terms of toolbox. Mm -hmm. For example, they know a lot of techniques. They're super good in mm -hmm. like, uh, different advancement calculus or mathematics mm -hmm. settings but when they solve a problem or like when they come up with a problem and i look at i don't find it really interesting mm -hmm. or it's like it's it's like a big machinery but fades away in time because it doesn't lead to somewhere else yeah so i would say this is not yes. a good question yes. but like yes i think yes. was a good, was a good yeah and so how to and of course i mean there is you can sort of Post hoc justify that this was a good question because it brought, it, it answering it brought something, and this is you can't know that beforehand, right? Yeah. Except in some cases you can. I mean, if someone proposes your your gazillions version of the Barabash Albert model with this tiny change mm -hmm. in the model, so of course it's not going to lead anywhere. So you can do these very small incremental things that are most probably not leading anywhere. But I would say that a good way of, of identifying things is to ask yourself about the potential of this work. Mm -hmm. So why would or what yeah why would someone cite this work mm -hmm. like in 10 years or in 15 years? Mm -hmm. So what nugget of gold should your work could your work potentially produce that would be so important that people might be so somehow rely on so somehow the future would rely on it future theories future methods models would rely on or would build on top of that mm -hmm. so i think that's something that if and, and that's a question that if you think of the ising model that yeah in one day it's like this we don't know what's there in 2D, so maybe there's something interesting enough that it changes things. Mm -hmm. So let's try it out, or, or in 3D, or in some other D. Mm -hmm. So so kind of trying to think into the deeper future, that you are addressing something fundamental enough, even if it's not a super big problem, even if it's a smaller problem, but addressing something fundamental enough that... that yeah, I see. In ten years, point. someone could. But but like in read practice, your work with interest. Yeah, sure. But in practice, imagine I'm your PhD student. I come to you and say, "Yeah, I have this idea," uh, and I start explaining to you. 
then how in practice you respond to that you know like uh well usually i would start by asking a lot of questions and then because, because through one, a long discussion mm, would be my answer here because it's mm, it's not easy to figure out if something is meaning yeah and that's probably the best skills of, or i mean the most difficult skills for a scientist to obtain this kind of intuition that hmm, I smell something might be here something this this might be somewhere so this is yeah it's not it's not a straightforward that there's an algorithm you know tick this ticks the right yeah. boxes also I would kind of sometimes err on the side of just trying it out and seeing what happens because as we discussed before science benefits from a bit of randomness, a bit of scatter, a bit of asking all sorts of different mm. things and going into all sorts of directions. So, so yeah, Long seeing day. seeing seeing yeah. what happens might be one one solution. But I don't think there's a yeah. If if anyone knew this, this is a bit like how a question like how do you get rich on the stock market? No one knows. If, mm -hmm. This is a bit of the same question that how do you know that question is both answerable and very important and this will absolutely with certainty lead somewhere we we don't know because we haven't seen the answer yet and we don't <laughs> for any question we also don't know beforehand if we can actually solve it so this is this is yeah like have you heard this type of conversation that people in art have that there is a form and there is content and then say no there is no form and content and like one unity and there is whole discussion around it once I was talking to a friend of mine who is like almost a senior scientist and he said, if you ask a question, like if you bring a question to me, by the way that you only phrase it, it doesn't matter it leads somewhere or not. It's a matter of we spend some time together and we really understand each other that what do you mean by that question? Mm -hmm. Because there are a lot of very nicely phrased questions that at the back end of the thoughts, it's something else, but like mm, when you start also, digging like, out, yes, that's also, it's, it's somewhere yeah, else. What, what, what is the actual question and how do you actually, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yes. yeah. I mean, I, I agree. you remember the day we had this project in this how like locality of networks mm, affect yes. the spread of the disease. Yes. It was like something that people may have asked it several times mm. that have may skip it or something, but for us it happened in a way that there was this time that like there was this history of papers that there were first like this uh, configuration type of models, then there was this scale-free behavior, mm -hmm. then there was this hops, then a lot of papers like Tom Britton's came that, yes, this effect is big, but we realized it is not. And we were right to ask this question now. I mean, if we have asked this question like 20 years before, maybe we would skip it as other people have done, right? Because mm -hmm. Because like the machinery or the thing that we are using now is the same as what people were using at least 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah. We are not doing anything new fancy. It's not like we have invented a new machinery or new toolbox for that. No, we are just asking a question that anyone could have asked basically about. But this is, and this is the thing with questions that some sometimes the sort of time is yeah. right for the question, you know, yeah. that... But because of these results here and because of those results here and because of the questions that people ask there or there or there, no, the time is right for for exactly. our question. And this is a bit like, you know, Stuart Kaufman's um, adjacent possible that, that mm -hmm. there is this surface of possibilities that gives rise to more possibilities yeah, yeah. that give. So it's a bit, bit. So you agree that it's possibly. not only a matter of what question you're asking, it's like when you're asking that as well. And yeah, it's it's a yeah, it's 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 a question of when you are asking that, mm -hmm. um, because no question is in ever in isolation. So science mm -hmm. is like, yeah, science is a network. I, I believe you, you can ask some things mm -hmm. in isolation, but this will not matter to anyone because yeah. it's not like it's not talking to the other nodes of the network, exactly. so to speak. So yeah, uh, actually, it it reminds me there there. It, I guess it's one of the Feynman's messenger lectures at Cornell that he draws this picture, that there are these points in space. And science, a lot of people believe that science is like that it starts from roots and then goes to the leaves. But the picture that Feynman draw there is like that there are dots and we are randomly connecting each yes. point and we don't know what further because we don't know what the space we're talking yes. about. 
yes. sometimes we start connecting things and the structure happens and yes. we can say, okay, we yes. can point this way and that yes. way. Yes. Okay. Then in practice, <clears throat> imagine you want to apply for a grant. Oh. That's a different issue. It's not oh, a yes, uh, It's a very different issue. So then uh, how do you narrow down your research? Because at the very end in practice, you need money to do research. Yeah. Uh, I wish I knew because I mean, I think now we, we have been talking about science as this, this multidimensional High dimensional network of uh, which is a big fractal mess. And yeah, I mean, we're moving from temple of science to academia. Yeah, and, and, and right? now, now we have grant agencies that want to take all of this high dimensional beauty and view that as a sort of series of concrete slabs, like work package one is the work package two is the work package, which is which is not how things should be, mm -hmm. in my view. This is managerialism, and we should not. We should we should oppose it, but still, this is the way we get funding. That that out of this exploration in high dimensional spaces, we need to we need to dump it down to a series of work packages or tasks or questions that we we simple questions that we ask where we can basically with confidence state that we know the answer beforehand. Yeah. Mostly, it's like this. So, so it's not something that that I enjoy. But on the other hand, then this is a bit like fiction. So, so you you take your scientific thoughts and then you sort of mangle them into a simplified story mm -hmm. that 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 uh, contains some answerable sub questions that are somehow maybe linked to an overarching th theme that. Mm -hmm that the grant agencies could consider important. That, that's the big thing that and this is, the whole thing makes sense. And I'm asking these sub questions and I think that these are the answers that I will get, but, but yeah, so. So the meaning of it for a layman is something that, yeah. so, why do we do, if, if you explain this to your grandmother, why do you do okay. this? It's, it's a bit more I like see this. your point, but like, let me ask it this way. So you have been in network science since it's birth. Imagine that if you hadn't had this type of limitations over funding and proposal rejections or whatever, if you have had enough money since then, how your research would have been different from today? Do you know or can you guess? Or... No, I, I have no idea. Because, I, have, I mean, we have, have this dream no idea. idea temple of science that yes, science should be this, science should be done like this way. But in practice, these days, we are creatures of the funding agencies, you know? Yes. Yes, I mean, we have this very nice paper, but it doesn't mm -hmm. get anywhere because no fancy journal want to publish mm -hmm. it for some reason. And then when you don't publish in fancy journal, you do not get enough reputation. So you cannot use your reputation for getting yet another funding to work on that. And yes. it fades away. And then working in a field like we do, your reputation doesn't even matter because your grants will be evaluated by people from some random adjacent fields. Mm -hmm. So it's it's even more difficult for, for, for an interdisciplinary scientist because everyone can always mm -hmm. reject you on the grounds that this is not physics or computer science or mathematics mm -hmm. or social science or whatever. So this, it's, it's, it's even more difficult. But yeah, I mean, how would things have been different if I would have had infinite funding? I, do, I have no idea. And I don't think infinite funding would be great. I mean, it's I think science kind of naturally happens in fairly small groups of mm -hmm. people learning the same language, learning the same ideas, learning to communicate. It's, it's a bit like being in a band. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's like five people on stage. It's not like 50, 50 people on stage. Mm -hmm. uh, symphony orchestras are a bit different. Someone already wrote the music and they are just sort of, they yeah, are yeah, just yeah. playing it. But if you have things like improvisation, and so it's usually it's small. This gets maybe a bit to the, Robin Dunbar's type of ideas, but but I, I would think that science happens best in small groups of smart people. And unless you have very expensive, unless you need very expensive instrumentation or something like that, we don't because we yeah. use pen and paper and computers on our brains, then I think small groups are good if you have good mm -hmm. people who work on together uh, on things. I really now, like this mean like band metaphor. Uh, mm. 
getting back to that, do you have any like old collabor collaborator that you have all have been publishing a lot with them since? Well, Janos kept it. Yeah, I know. Certainly, yeah. so. so well, long time me, was <laughs> here. Yeah. Since a very long time. Martin Kassai. So, okay. I mean, yeah, there are people who and have. What have has been. made this type of links to be this much, uh, like, longing? You know, was this, it this a matter man. of yeah. thinking that you, you guys could. Get on the same page. I think it's be... yeah. I, I think it's sort of sort of that that sharing a common understanding of how things are, and and having a sort of shared view of things that you don't need to mm -hmm. explain. So it's a bit like you know old couples, old yeah. married couples don't have to. They know what the other one is. Yeah, thinking. it's exactly. a bit more like this that the, the things get easier because you you just know. Mm. And then, then progress is faster because you don't need to start everything from scratch in a way. Mm -hmm. But then on the other hand, it's good to have also new collaborations mm -hmm. because then it then you don't get you don't get this kind of tunnel vision that this is the way I think and I've always thought like yeah. this, which is by the way one of the reasons why I do so many things, because I I really want to try out different things to to not get tunnel vision and because sometimes you do better things if you work on something that you don't know everything about but given this much of variety have you ever messed up a project at least from your standards well every single one of them <laughs> but of course i mean there are dots i mean the things don't necessarily work mm -hmm. that always happens and and if that doesn't happen then then the bar is not high enough i mean in science it's not like yeah, sometimes you try out things that don't really work. I don't think that things you can always publish something about the thing that you did some some place, but but the, the sort of grandiose goals that you may have had don't always Thank work. You. And sometimes you find out that yeah, this is a nice question and mm -hmm. we got far, but people did this ten years ago mm -hmm. because we didn't know this literature. That can happen. Yeah. Well. So yeah, yeah, of course, and I think it's part of the. Do you have a single author paper? No, I don't think. And why do you think it is that? Is it like you believe you shouldn't even do it or it has never happened or it's it like... Has mostly just, I'm, I'm, I have two author papers, so yeah. but I, it has just not ever happened. Do you have any special like stance over this like that? Does it even matter how many authors are in a paper? Depends on on the point of view. Who who what's what's what are and now we get to a very big philosophical question. We can spend like hours on that. What is science for? Mm -hmm. It depends on that question. So so if we think from the point of view of people's careers, which mm -hmm. science is too much far too much about nowadays, then yeah, if you are a PhD student and then you are in a fifteen, you are number ten in a fifteen author paper, then this will this will not exactly be very helpful for your career, right? Mm -hmm. So this will hinder your career. It's not going to count. But if that paper contains something that has scientific meaning, and it could only happen if these 15 people came together and did this together, then there's reason for yeah. its existence. And this is this is this is kind of Far too much of how we think of science nowadays is that it's about people's careers. Mm -hmm. Whereas I would, as some sort of old idealistic hippie, I would want to view science as something that we do for the benefit of mankind. It's not a competitive sport. It's not about us. Mm -hmm. It's about the science. And if, if you take that point of view, then, well, you see that academia is messed up in very many ways because this is much more like individual competitive sports like rather than team building or it it is it doesn't optimize science it optimizes something else yeah but yeah for the sake of science it doesn't absolutely matter how many people you mm. have authoring a paper if this is how many it takes yeah. then this is how many it takes and usually i do better science if i talk with people Mm -hmm. Because most of good science emerges out of conversations. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. If I try to do things alone, I really can't do yeah. So I need someone to <laughs> kick me out of it. So mm -hmm. that's why I want to collaborate with people. I see. Better things come out of it. Yeah.
And do you pre do you have any preference over like working with people of the same status, like no, researchers, or then you prefer to work with younger? No, I, I prefer to work with people who are nice and smart and have ideas and are interested and enthusiastic about mm -hmm. the thing we do. Status doesn't matter. So, so aren't you that type of PI who just wants to outsource the work to people have just the idea and say? Go on, implement it. <laughs> Come with it. Sometimes that would be brilliant if if this if this could happen. It would. I I, I wish I I would once be in a situation where this, this this happens that I just have an idea and then then I toss it somewhere and people yeah. return with the solution. That never. No, no, I'm not not entirely serious here. So it depends. I mean, of course, when you are working on very many projects, then sometimes or very often there is a natural division of labor. Mm -hmm. And very often because people need their thesis and people need their, yeah, the mm -hmm. career system requires that people yeah. do things, then it's natural that, yeah, okay, you are the young student here who does some coding mm -hmm. and you do theory. I like to outsource certain types of theory to people who do it much better than me, for example. Mm -hmm. That's that's how but we get the a... best science out of it. Mm -hmm. But then at the same time, I always, myself, I want to have at least some projects where I do hands-on work, mm -hmm. where I do the programming, where I do calculations. And... Yeah, because now you, I mean, we have worked together and uh, still you sometimes code yourself, sometimes do pen and paper calculations. Yeah. You do a lot of visualization still better than so many of us. And you also spend a lot of time on refining the manuscript. So mm -hmm. you kind of collaborate with people you work with in all the sides of the project i mean that's yeah that's what i try to do okay. no, but that's what also makes it interesting i mean it would mm. be i mean this this kind of situation where i had an idea some people go to it and they return with a perfect paper that we just something wouldn't it be boring i mean why would you want to do that it's it's okay. a bit i don't know it's a bit like again if we take a band metaphor yeah. then i would just write the song and then someone else would go and perform it on stage and then yeah. i'm like yeah Okay. Now, for the last question, I want to talk about this, that, okay, someone at my age in academia, finishing PhD, starting a postdoc, so mm. a very young researcher. Now, we are supposed in this situation in the world that there is this gap from leaving the grad school to becoming a professor at somewhere mm -hmm. that you are doing this type of researcher type of position and the idea is that you become independent researcher yep and by doing independent research it first comes with the idea of having a nice question or kind of a question which you can kind of settle somewhere like mm -hmm. yeah, i have a question i get some funding i work on that mm -hmm. uh how do you think someone at this stage should proceed with as a postdoc? As a postdoc, post that you are still are not as seasoned, you do not have that, mm -hmm. you have not developed that much of intuition, especially in complex systems and network science, that things are like rapidly changing. Yeah. So, like for example, there was like these waves of multi-layer networks, yes. like hypergraphs, yes. and like these community detection type yes. of thing. Yep. And then you start realizing, okay, I'm new as like a researcher in the world and i have to because i do not have enough time to work on all the problems mm, yeah. and i'm not lucky enough yeah. to like have crazy collaboration at the moment and what i do now highly uh shape my future because people judge me based on this so if if i go one step in a wrong way it's not only one way so yeah, yeah. linear propagation yeah, yeah. of error <clears throat> yep. so yep. Yep, yep. what is your general recommendation for people who Leave your group as a PhD student, like they are now going for mm -hmm. postdoc. How do you think they should proceed? Well, first of all, I think, yeah, as a postdoc, you need to get something done. That's kind of, this is part of the science career system. So you can't take too many risks. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. But therefore, my recommendation would be to build on something that you know already, that you have done. So on your, on your thesis, you can take a bit of different directions, but... Mm -hmm to start something that's entirely different. It's probably yeah. not a good thing at this stage. You can do that as a se senior professor, and then you can, you can start whatever. But but at that stage, I think it's it's sort of playing it, not playing it safe, but building on your mm -hmm. the level of knowledge that you already have. Also, because it is unique. No one else knows the things that you do. 
mm -hmm. and kind of realizing that oh, I'm actually not in a bad position here. I know these things. I've done these things. I know these things better than anyone. So how should I continue this path for a couple of papers? That would, and maybe with some other people, because I suppose that you, of course, work somewhere else with some other people, right? So you don't continue in your mm -hmm. in your in your in the group where you got your PhD, you move to somewhere else. So I would try to combine the things that you've done and you know mm -hmm. with those that your new colleagues will okay. do and know, and try to see where's the sort of mm. where's the common ground there. Maybe they have ideas that that sort of mm. take your work to some other direction. Maybe maybe their work is going to some direction, and you can see that ah, oh, yeah, I know this method. I know this idea. We could yeah. sort of plug it in. So I think that's probably the most most and also then to enjoy doing all this because as a postdoc you will have a lot of time on your hands as compared to what happens when you become an assistant professor yeah. uh, then then all of a sudden so many so many people will take so much of your time to yeah. other things that that postdoc is good time for deep thinking so I that's, that's that's something that I but in general you mentioned this that you are you believe that scientists or researchers in their early days they work on projects that are more certain to get somewhere than in the old time do more risky stuff a bit like this yes. but but you have you thought about this that most of the great ideas when you are old enough you don't risk at it like i mean most of the crazy things apparently has happened in the early uh, yeah yeah that's, 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 that's like a dilemma that you want to do these great things, but yeah. you are scared of like losing the game or something. But at the same yeah, time, yeah, that's 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 the demo, and that has to do with sort of the overly career competition driven yeah. system of science of nowadays. So I don't know if 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 we would have had this system in in the nineteen early. Okay. So in the times when quantum mechanics was born, would it have been born? I don't. I have no idea. But so yeah. For your career, don't risk mm. too much of it. And I don't think that, and yeah, you can get crazy ideas later as well. Mm. I'm still, I'm, I, I hope still to get some very crazy and <laughs> new okay. and, and novel ideas. So it doesn't, it, it's not, it's not like you have to, okay. you have to solve all the biggest scientific That's problems good. in your twenties. Looking back now, is there anything that you would do differently when you look at them in your research or in your? In choosing projects and choosing who to work with, I don't know. Is there anything you would do differently, or you would ignore, or you would never do? No, probably probably not, because this has been kind of a not the random walk, but the walk along some gradients, mm -hmm. making the choices that were available at the times when the choices were made. So I I don't I don't think I would choose anything. Mm -hmm. very differently I think all the things that I've done have led me here to this point and I'm not sure if yeah yeah if I would have done something differently then that would mean that I would be somewhere else mm -hmm. right now and I okay. and he... <laughs> I have no idea where should <laughs> where that would be so yeah are you planning to retire in 10 or 20 years or something or you don't really well in 20 that? years they will kick me out that's ah. for certain uh, uh, in 10 years, I'm not eligible for retirement yet. In between those, I don't know. Most probably, I'm not going to be one of those kind of scientists who sort of clings on to things uh -huh. forever. So I don't know, maybe I'll go fishing or writing books or maybe yeah, I'll yeah. do something that's, that has to do with science, but, but from a less sort of formal. Is there any problem that you're still waiting to solve and you're saying, I should do it before? I retire or something. There are very many problems, of course, but I, because as I said, I don't believe in holy grails. I believe mm. in science progressing by people answering questions that lead to new questions. So, so I don't see any single thing like if one would, if, if, if I would have to name one thing right now that I think that I will want to put time and effort in before I retire is is basically 
and I hope there's enough time for that, is preparing for the next pandemic. So mm -hmm. looking back at, because network science has a ton of promise, right? and then this thing hits us. And then how different would the outcome have been if network science didn't even exist? Mm -hmm. So there were some very good things done in many countries that people did predictions of that, 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 and that in ways that could have never been done before, but yet. So what did we learn? I mean, if 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 now we, we know everything that happened during COVID, and then we take this knowledge, and then we try to build the tools where when the next one hits, we are better prepared. So how how should that happen? Yeah, I see. So this is something, this is a big, one of the big things. Yes. It's not one question. It's like, a, yeah, it's a, body it's of a cluster of questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, that's something that, that has I been see. a lot on my mind recently. Yeah, I, I, I wish we we could like talk about it in like the well, next two hours, but I guess <laughs> we, we should get back to other stuff today. Thank you for your time. It was a very Thank great you. conversation. I was waiting for this since my first day at Alta and we did it. So I'm <laughs> right. happy before leaving Alta, I could do this. Thank you everyone for listening to us. It was the great Yaris Armaki. Bye.